I remember meeting Michael Engler, the director in the audition, and we were just talking about it. And he was like, oh, he's like, do you have you, do you really love watching like period pieces? You, you fall into it so easily. Like this, you must, this is a passion of yours. And I was like, well, I was like, I don't know. Uh, I'm a stoner. I like to watch Rick and Morty. <laughs> and I walked out of the audition and um, I was like, shit, I don't know if I just said the wrong thing. I should have talked about Downton Abbey. Prepare your ears, humans. Happy, sad, confused begins now. I'm Josh Horowitz, and today on Happy, Sad, Confused, Thaisa Farmiga, from being a final girl to the Gilded Age to being a ginormous Harry Potter fan, plus my experience at the Toronto Film Festival. Hey guys, I'm Josh Horowitz, and welcome to another edition of Happy, Sad, Confused. Uh, so here I am in Toronto. If you're watching this on YouTube, you see I am in this weird random hotel room. Uh, circumstances have dictated that my Toronto stay was extended a little bit. Weather in New York made me stay a little longer than expected. I sound a little crappy. I apologize. I've had a cold. It's not COVID, apparently. Apparently, colds are still a thing. So, uh, struggling a little bit, but it's all good, guys. I've been doing the film festival thing, seeing a ton of great movies, so I can't really complain. Um, I want to apologize, though, just yet yeah, for the, the visuals, etc., the glitches in the video. It's not my usual setup, so working with the best that I can. But I want to present with, to you guys today a, uh, a flashback interview. This is actually from early 2022, my career conversation with Thaisa Farmiga, who I positively adore. Um, she's, of course, currently starring in The Nun 2, uh, which is dominating the box office, so I thought it was a good excuse to bring this one back, especially because most people did not get a chance to see this um, when it was uh, first launched. Um, I wasn't doing video back then on YouTube, so here you are, guys. Here is the gift that will keep on giving for perpetuity, my career conversation with Tysa Farmiga. Uh, we talk about a great many things, getting her start, um, her sister Vera Farmiga, her love of Harry Potter, fanfic, uh, being a final girl, an unlikely final girl at that, the Gilded Age, the Nun, so much more. You're going to dig it. But before we get to the main event today, uh, I do want to kind of catch you up on my film festival shenanigans. Uh, when last we spoke, you and I, I was um, in Telluride wrapping up that great film festival, which was fantastic. Uh, I went kind of straight from that to t Toronto. So again, for those that don't know the way of the land this time of year, this is when really the big guns come out with the awards contenders. And that happens in quick succession uh, with the Venice Film Festival, Telluride, which are actually going on at the same time. They both now since wrapped and right straight into Toronto, the Toronto Film Festival, which is a, similarly a big launching pad for many awards um, contenders. Uh, soon, in about uh, about a month from now, a little less, we'll have the New York Film Festival, which will have yet another uh, group of, of films, most of which we've seen by now, or the folks that do this kind of thing have seen by now, but some new new ones as well. So, my Toronto um, mixed bag of films, but I did get a chance to see a bunch of stuff that I really liked. Uh, I didn't see as many as I wanted because I was laid up in bed with my poor sad cold, but I did get a chance to see a few films that I, I really dug and wanted to pass on those recommendations to you guys. So, the top three I want to mention um, are our beloved Anna Kendrick's directing debut. Yeah, Woman of the Hour. Uh, this is just sold to Netflix, coming off of the great screenings here in Toronto. This is a fascinating film that stars Anna that is based on a true story. It is a harrowing, intense film. Um, slight bits of comedy in it, but this is not a comedy, guys. This is the true story of a man who went on the dating game show, that competition silly show, who happened to be uh, a killer. Literally a serial killer. And a, a horrendous one at that. Not, not that there's any such a thing as a good serial killer, but this one is dark and horrible. And um, this film is so intense, so well-crafted, so impressive a debut by Anna Kendrick. So happy for her. Um, yeah, this has shades of Zodiac in it, guys. That's like the biggest influence I would say on this film, and that is that's high praise. So I want to mention that one. Sold to Netflix. I don't know if they're going to release it this year or not, but keep it keep it um, on your brain because that's what worth checking out. Um, also. I just, my last uh, uh, film at Toronto was Hitman um, from Richard Linklater, of course, and co-written 
by our Glenn Powell. So happy for Glenn. Um, I would say this is like a star-making performance, but he's kind of already had a few of those. But this this could potentially even take him to another level because uh, this is again very. This one's very loosely based on true life events. But suffice it to say, Glenn plays a um, teacher slash undercover cop who poses as a hitman. Um, it's my my shorthand for this coming out of the screening is um, if Out of Sight and Fletch had a baby, it would be this film. It is fun, light, breezy, sexy, romantic. Um, it stars uh, um, Glenn front and center with an actress that I'm going to butcher the name of, so I'm not even going to say it because I don't want to offend her. She's been in some stuff lately um, that, again, I'm blanking on. This is Film Festival Brain. Look it up. But Hitman stars uh, Glenn, and the leading lady is fantastic. They have great chemistry, and it's uh, authentically like a really romantic, sexy uh, film, which is rare nowadays. Um, and it's funny, and it's one of Linklater's best in years. So um, that one also didn't have distribution coming into this will be snapped up in an instant because it, it, it definitely works. My favorite film, I think, of the festival uh, was Dream Scenario from A24. This one is definitely coming out this year uh, in November. This is Nick Cage doing Nick Cage. Um, uh, not in the way playing Nick Cage, but doing like a big swing fun part. Um, but not in a big way, actually. It's a, it's, he's playing this a professor again, a sad sack professor who, get this, uh, ends up being um, kind of in the dreams of many people around the world. So it definitely has that Charlie Kaufman-esque thing. It will definitely play as a great companion piece one day to adaptation. It's very funny. It's very insightful about the world we live in today, about celebrity and social media. Um, and, and it features a kick-ass Nick Cage performance in the middle, which is always a treat. So those are my top three. Uh, there's a bunch of other stuff that I enjoyed to varying degrees. I love seeing our Jodie Comer again in another festival film. This one's called The End We Start From. Real showcase for her. I mean, kind of as any Jodie Comer film is. And this one, it's pretty intense. Uh, it, it takes place kind of after a climate disaster, and she's a young mother. And um, kind of Children of Men-esque vibes to it. Um, but she's fantastic. It's produced by Benedict Cumberbatch, who has a small role as well. Um, yeah, that one I think is also seeking distribution, but it will be snapped up if for no other reason because Jodie um, is excellent in it, as she always is. So those are the standout ones I, I, I guess I wanted to mention. Other things worked to varying degrees. I saw Taika Waititi's new film, Next Goal Wins, which is fun and works. Um, yeah. Lots of, lots of cool stuff. So anyway, um, that's my tease, my summary in brief of my Toronto Film Festival experience. Um, hope you guys get something out of that. And again, I apologize that I look and sound like crap. This is, this is festival life. This is the real thing. You see a lot of movies and you feel like crap by the end because you're kind of running around just sitting in closed spaces with a lot of people and traveling a lot. Woe is me, I know. Okay, let's get to the main event, but before we do that, um, I do want to mention if you're in the New York area, October 9th, I'm doing my next live uh, edition of Happy, Sad, Confused with Andrew Rannells and Josh Gad. The Book of Mormon duo is reuniting for another big Broadway musical. It's called Gutenberg the Musical. I'm so psyched. I'm going to be seeing it very soon. These guys are hysterical. Um, I know them both. Andrew's on the podcast. Josh surprisingly never has, um, but he's always hysterical. So I can't wait to see them. Uh, get your tickets now. Uh, info's in the show notes. You know what to do. Uh, if you can't be there in person, you can watch us virtually live um, and hope to see a good crowd it at 92nd Street. Why? It's been it's been a minute because of all these strikes. It's hard to like put these together, but because these gentlemen are promoting theater work, they are allowed to chat. So I'm very relieved about that. Okay. Main event for the for you guys that are here for Tysa Farmiga, wait no longer. Here it is. Uh, this was recorded in early 2022. Lots of talk, Gilded Age, none, Final Girls, all the stuff you like, plus her love of Harry Potter. What more can you ask for? Remember to review, rate, and subscribe to Happy Sick Confused. Spread the good word and enjoy this chat with me and Tysa Farmiga. Well, the Thai heads are going to be very excited. We got Thaisa Farmiga. Is that what they call call your fans? What do they call the Thaisa Farmiga fans? Oh, I have no idea. I don't. I don't think there's a proper name. I mean, I've been doing this for a decade, and I don't think there's a proper name unless I'm that out of touch with 
social media and the internet, which I- You're so I, aloof. You're so out of it. You don't know. I have to, listen, I hide. <laughs> Technology <laughs> scares me. I swear to God. Um, I No, I am excited to catch up. We've never had a chance to do kind of our deep dive conversation. Always a fan of yours. Congratulations on the Gilded Age, the ginormous undertaking from Julian Fellows. Um, it's funny because it's like, outside of like a Marvel movie or like a Star Wars movie, like no, nothing gets this kind of budget. So it's kind of cool to see like the resources to bear that the Downton Abbey name yeah. can bring, right? So congrats. Oh yeah, thank you gosh, I appreciate it. I'm happy to be here, I'm excited to chat. All right, so so uh, a lot to dig into. Uh, first, I mentioned uh, the Taisa Farmiga uh, obsessives. We don't know what their names are, but let's talk about what you were what you were into growing up. Who who would you have been the president of a fan club of? What were the posters in the Man. room? Let's 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 dive deep um, and start. All right, let's 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 get into it. Um, for <laughs> like, me, yeah. I I'm like I'm like shit. What was I? No, I um I read a lot of Harry Potter fanfic when I was a teenager. That was my outlet. That was Wait, my way did, to like. Did you actually read the Harry Potter books? You just skip right to I the did. fanfic. No, no. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I read the books, watched films, went back and forth. You know, between the books and the movies coming out. I remember reading the last book, and I was just like, "Damn, that's it! Like, it's done." And I was so sad, so I started like googling, like, "What do you do when you finish a book?" And and then I discovered this world of fan fiction. What was, so were you the right age for that? Like when the books were coming out every year, like, were you like at the bookstore? Was that, was it? Yeah. I mean, my, I think, yeah. Um, I, I don't remember like specific age, but I remember like my brother was super into them and he's six years older than me. Um, but I mean, like as soon as he, I mean, he would have to read it first, of course, because, you know, seniority bullshit, he would get it first <laughs> then I would get my hands on it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I was like, I don't know. I don't know the years it came out, but I was like right there. Were you, were you, have you been, you've been sorted? I take it. What, what house are you in? Ravenclaw. Were you, pr- I can't tell if you're proud or you're resigned. I am. You- I am proud. It's hard too, because I've been living with a Slytherin. My partner is a Slytherin. <laughs> oh, that's, it can be dangerous. It can be dangerous. <laughs> so I feel yeah. like, you know, I'm, uh, I'm definitely a Ravenclaw, but you know, it's been, it's been a fun few years. <laughs> <laughs> have you done the Wizarding World? Uh, no, I haven't. Crowds kind of freak me out. I like <laughs> IE fanfic. You get to experience everything through, you know, like okay. a nice screen. Now, I, as I recall, and we're going to dance around, we're going to jump around because my, my brain works this way. Maybe the first time I met you was actually with Emma uh, Watson. Um, I think for, so. For definitely, yeah, for sure. Um, my recollection, I don't expect you to remember this, but I have a weird photo that commemorates when I think maybe I met you. We were, we did like Didn't a- did we take a selfie? Yes, thank you. <laughs> How do you listen? It is such a weird photo because it's like, it's, it's me and the cast of Bling Ring, which included you and Emma, of course. And um, we did like a special MTV event on a stage at the Universal City Walk. Yeah, I remember there being a, I couldn't remember, I remember it being like a big thing. It wasn't just like walking into a room or like doing the press junket and you're just like circled through. It was like a thing. Oh, this was a thing. And the thing included, for, I don't even know why, whose idea it was, me, like probably like a 30 year old dude, way too old to be doing a silly <laughs> selfie, um, but doing a selfie. And it was like, I don't know. I feel like Emma was like flashing like gang signs. It was like a weird, it was a weird photo. The photo exists. Probably. The photo does exist. Someone's going to find it and pull it up. That's I remember someone... seeing it. I feel like I get tagged in it every so often on Instagram. You know what I mean? Like it, it recycles, it comes up. Oh no, that's probably me tagging you and I'll do it again. Don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So growing up, uh, let's get into some biographical detail. Big family. I did not yeah. realize how many, do I have this right? The youngest of seven? Yes, I'm number seven. I have six older siblings. Wow. Okay. So mm-hmm. were you left to your own devices? Did they feed you enough? Like, did they remember <laughs> you were around? What was, what was the dynamic? Um, a little bit of it all. Yeah, I feel like I was left to my devices a lot, my own devices a lot, because um, both my parents worked and, um, you know, my mom worked part-time, my dad worked full-time. Um, and, you know, sh- again, I my my brother would always was always around. He's six years older. My sister's three years older than me, the closest, my closest two siblings. So there's always like, there's always like someone who was technically allowed to watch me around. So, you know, we just kind of, we were just kind of left, but um, yeah, my parents, it's the same parents for all the kids. And the first four kids were born 11 years, no kids. And then the last three. So it's kind of like two, two groupings. 
Got it. It's funny because I looked up, I'm the youngest of, of only three, but I looked up then I was curious, like, I, I never remember this, but like what, like the characteristics are people say are mm-hmm. endemic of youngest. And I don't uh-huh. fit, I, I only fit like half of these. I'm curious how, where you, how you, think right. you fit into these. So it said here, according to my uh, Googling, a uh, highly social, it's not me. Is that you? Um, no. I mean, if you throw me into, if you throw me into a social situation, I can like turn on and, and, and do it, but like, I don't speak them out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Same. I, I relate to that. Confident. Would you consider yourself a confident person? I'm pretty confident, okay. but like that developed in my, that developed in my twenties. And I was like, I was a shy and secure antisocial teenager. Right. Gotcha. I.e. fanfic. Yep. Yep. I got, okay. We're speaking the same language. Uh, creative. Yes, of course. Right. That sucks. Yeah, I'm creative. I mean, I have to say that I, I, I would like, I would first define myself as logical above creative. Oh, interesting. I have a very mathematical brain. I've always loved numbers and finance and chess. And um, I was, uh, I was definitely the 13 year old in chess club. Um, Does that and creative, apply I to, like, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, creative. Yes. Because obviously like acting is a very creative outlet but for me sometimes it's like I don't know I love approaching the the emotions of it and and, and sorting out human emotion and, and it kind of it feels like an equation to me <laughs> right 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 yeah well and then this is this goes hand in hand with that it says good at problem solving so that sounds about right oh right? yes oh my god give me a problem I will solve it <laughs> <laughs> so were you according to the uh, never reliable World Wide web homeschooled after the fourth grade mm-hmm. I was from yeah fourth grade through high school Okay. So again, we talked, we've talked a little bit about sort of like finding your place, being social or not social Mm -hmm. as a teenager. How did that, I don't know, how did that help hinder you acclimating, relating to kids your age? Because that's obviously a unique, unique experience. For sure. Um, You know, I think I was lucky because in the area of of New Jersey, where we lived, there was actually a pretty um, big homeschool community. So I feel like we definitely weekly, we had um, uh, classes and activities outside the home. So we got to interact and socialize with people. Um, You know, I think coming from a family of so many older siblings, I had people to speak for me. So a lot of times, you know, sometimes the youngest they'll say is loud because they have to be heard. But I don't know. I was kind of more, I was more of the observant one watching and, you know, speaking only when I, when I had something really good to say. Got it. Got it. Um, so yeah, you know, socialization, I feel like it wasn't really until I started acting then and, and playing, um, getting to play other characters and pull out parts of my own personality to put, to instill in these characters that I figured out kind of who I was and, and, and really how to communicate. So it's interesting. Usually I, uh, I, I go to the the comfort movie I ask people to, to select a little bit later on in the conversation, but this kind of dovetails mm-hmm. with what we're talking about a bit. What I'm curious if it's a, a reason maybe you relate to this story. Uh, you chose a comfort movie that that I would guess a lot of people share uh, with you. Uh, what did you right. select, Taysa? I selected Mean Girls. So the protagonist of Mean Girls is indeed a homeschooled young woman. Okay. Uh, who maybe hasn't been socialized in the in the way that others have? Did you find yourself relating to that character when you first saw the film? For sure. You know, I don't even remember the first time I, I don't remember the first time I watched it, but I know like subsequent times, like definitely. You know, I was I was a moody teenager. I was antisocial. I was homeschooled. You know, I think I I think I appreciated the um, I don't know sort of like analytical um, um, like view of what high school, public high school could be through the eyes of an outsider. Um, right. So for sure, I'm, I'm sure that played into it. But at the time, it wasn't like, oh, she's homeschooled like me. <laughs> that only it came in more podcasts like, oh, later. She's weird. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, you know, years later after the fanfic. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, by my math, you would have been about 10 years old when it came out. Do you think you saw it when it first came out? Like, do you remember when you first started to really get into it and why? I don't I don't have um, I like I was trying to remember to see if like I can't remember when I first saw it. I don't know if I saw it in theaters. I just have no recollection of it whatsoever. The first time I watched it, I just remember like every time I'd scroll on TV, it's like, oh, Mean Girls is on again. You know what I mean? It's just sort of like, yeah, has always been there. Yep. So who, uh, do you have a favorite character in there? Like what jumps out at you? Um, favorite character, favorite scene, obviously a very quotable movie. What are the touchstones very quotable for you? Movie. Um, favorite character is always Janice. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I just love her. I mean, it's probably why I also was attracted to Violet from American Horror Story, my, my first character, because she kind of just like says what she, you know, what she thinks and how she feels. There's no bullshit. I love that. Yep. Um, favorite scene? Uh, God, I don't know. It's just like, it's just, I feel like every scene has some sort of highlight. I think my favorite quote, I don't remember when it comes to the movie, but it's like when, when um, Amanda Seyfried's character is like, I think I have ESPN. My 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 boobs can feel when 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 it's gonna rain. I I always died. I was like ESPN. Ah, 
perfection. The genius of Tina Fey right there. Oh of my course. God, so good. It's so damn funny. So yeah, for, for those, I mean, everybody knows, but uh, directed by Mark Waters, who's interesting because he, uh, you know, 10, 15 years prior had done Heathers, of course, which similarly really captured a, a, a generation, a zeitgeist kind of moment and yeah. written by the great Tina Fey. So have you, um, I'm always curious, like of these movies that we love, <clears throat> excuse me, have you interacted? Have you ever met? Tina Fey, have you uh, um, met Lindsay Lohan or, <laughs> any, or Rachel McAdams? Yeah, no, uh, yes, Rachel McAdams, yes. No, never met Tina Fey. Um, I have met, um, oh my God, who plays, who plays? Uh, Leslie, no, uh, Amy Poehler. I met Amy oh, Poehler course. once, yeah. but I was like wasted and you know, I felt, <laughs> it was at some party and I'm pretty sure I just like grinned at her the whole time. Um, the best way to, to, to meet our heroes though is when we're a little, <laughs> little drunk more confident yeah. um no so yeah Rachel McAdams I um I did uh I did this this I did a, a live reading of this play called Charming for the Blacklist um and Rachel McAdams was one of the other like, few actors that that did this and um yeah I mean I was pretty freaking giddy when I you know when I got to got to meet her I mean I didn't show it I always like I like that pool outside I don't you know what I mean yeah. um so yeah, I don't know. I was freaking giddy and, and I go up to her and I be stay high and she's just um I don't know, she's just so intelligent and gorgeous and so personable and I crushed so hard and I just like was in a daze. <laughs> she's very Canadian, very nice, very sweet. very nice. Yeah, it was awesome. So that that was definitely that was definitely a highlight. I've seen the have you seen the musical? Well, I've seen the musical here in New York. It's pretty great. And I'm not not wouldn't necessarily be my cup of tea you would think on paper, but I really dug it. I would highly Wait, recommend musical it. for for mean girls. Oh no, I haven't seen it. Definitely recommend it. Yeah. Cool. Have you seen? Wait, jumping back to Harry Potter, have you seen Cursed Child? No, I haven't. What? We 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 got tickets. I can't remember what happened, but then we had to get we had to sell them because. Oh. I don't know. Work, I don't know. Work. Like something. Yeah, you know, something Life. came up, but no, I haven't seen it again. Like that's the thing. It's like I don't know. Like a fangirl right in front of me, but then I don't I don't go to the outside. Think as much does that make sense yeah yeah you're, except like when to, you're I like to fangirl in private yeah <laughs> it's a special time it's a taste of time <laughs> oh god yeah gosh um okay so as people may or may not know um of course uh, people of course know vera is your sister uh mm -hmm. she you know she predates you of course career-wise but also the fact that like you weren't and uh, it wasn't your ambition to be an actor uh growing up but then if I do the math, she was being very, she was very successful when you were probably, I don't know, 10, 12. She probably had already been nominated by, uh, for an Oscar. Yeah. She was in Departed, Up in the Air, et cetera. So I'm curious, like what your view was, like, were you, were you ever on sets? Were you visiting her? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, not too many times. It wasn't like a common occurrence, but definitely got to visit her on set. Um, uh, I remember like the first set I remember visiting was in Vancouver. I think it was a, a TV show she did called UC Undercover. Okay. It was some like cop show. Nice. Um, and I just remember that Crafty had these like little bite-sized brownies. And that was all I did for about seven days straight was sneak into Crafty and eat brownies. Um, and I remember and that was the day little, you decided you wanted to be an actor. You're like, wait, free brownies? Free brownies? Um, no, like I, I was into it, but like, I don't know, I, you know, food. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I get it. Lights, cameras, food, <laughs> like what? <laughs> the pillars of um, life right there yeah, yeah no my sister my sister larissa she um she was like sitting by the monitor she's three years older than me so i think she was like 13 14 at the time and um you know, she had the headphones on got the monitor and she was super excited and she was like hmm, i think i like the second take whereas wow. i was way in the back um but yeah i don't know it was always vera's job it was um mm -hmm. yeah it's just kind of like what she did to make money and it was super cool but i don't know i wanted to be an accountant <laughs> right <laughs> i'm gonna do something glamorous like accounting <laughs> But you weren't like excited by like, you know, I would think most kids like, oh my God, my sister is in a movie with Leonardo DiCaprio and Matt Damon. My sister's like hanging out with yeah. George Clooney. That didn't register in a way. It was, I mean, it was no, kind of just George work. Clooney, George Clooney for sure. Um, Cause I was, you know, before I started acting, I was, so when I was like 14, uh, like 13, 14, 15, I um, started traveling with, oh no, I guess it must've been like 15. Cause I started traveling with Vera as the babysitter um, when she was filming. Cause she gave birth to her son, Finn um and immediately i think not even like a month later she had a film <clears throat> excuse me up in the air wow yeah. um so i was you know jet setting with her and i was the babysitter and i love that um which one thing homeschooling i was super happy about gave me the flexibility to like hop on a plane and go 
Right. Um, but yeah, no, for sure. Like I remember how excited the women at my mom's work in the doctor's office got when they were like, you met George Clooney. I was like, yeah, you kissed the top of my head. They were like, did you wash your hair? I was like, yeah, I washed my hair. Don't be weird. <laughs> but let me tell you about the brownies that were on the set. We got George Clooney. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so no, I mean, there was always, I don't know. I guess I kind of grew up with like that being the normal for Vera that I didn't really, um, yeah, like obviously I knew people around the world. I mean, like people around our world, um, whether it's the women in my mom's office or wherever, um, or kids at school, they, um, oh, wow, your sister's an actress. But it kind of just, it just was what it was because Vera was always Vera when she was home. You know, she's my older sure. sister. Just like, take me a noogie, you know? <laughs> I hope the noogies have stopped by now. <sighs> you know, actually they don't. They happen <laughs> like when I don't, when I don't expect it, it happens. Oh, God, always got to be on the defensive. Happy, Set Confused is sponsored by BetterHelp. We love BetterHelp here at Happy, Set Confused because quite simply, BetterHelp helps people cope with all the stresses of life. I find myself with an overactive, worrisome brain at times. It keeps me up at night worrying about work responsibilities, family responsibilities. All of it can feel just insurmountable. And I'm sure if you're anything like me, you've experienced something similar. It turns out one great way to make those overactive racing thoughts go away is to talk them through. Therapy can be a place for that. So you can get out all those negative thought cycles and find some true mental and emotional peace. Therapy has helped me in the past and it can help you. It can help you and your family, your loved ones, everybody in your orbit. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's really designed to be convenient and flexible and suited to your whole schedule. That's the whole idea. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire. You get matched with a licensed therapist and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. So get a break from your thoughts with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com HSC to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash HSC. So your entry was through Vera again. She's she was directing a film, and uh, she looked no further than you. And for so, like, what was your attitude about that? Like, when you when you agreed to be in the film, was it like, hey, it'll be a fun summer or whatever it is you shot, and that's it, or was it like, all right, maybe this is a thing, maybe this will be a real thing? I was super excited. It was during the summer. It was the start of summer. I was super excited to get away from my parents for two months. <laughs> I mean, I was 15. You know what I mean? Like who wants to be, who wants to be stuck at home with, with parents telling you what to do. And I, you know, hormone imbalances and feelings and all that going on. I was excited to hang out with Vera and, and her husband, my brother-in-law, Ren, who I just adore. And again, Vera just had her son, Finn. Funny enough, he played my 15 month old daughter in the film Higher Ground that Vera directed. Right. Um, so when I wasn't when I wasn't filming, I was babysitting him and, and it was nice to just be on set. I think that was the first time I ever realized or the first time I ever, yeah, I realized that like I enjoyed the set atmosphere. Like mm-hmm. I just loved the camaraderie and how quickly it feels like a family and, and you're all in this together. There's not very many jobs where you work 14 hours a day and, and, and you rely on each other emotionally too. Right. I thought was, that was cool. Was did that set the precedent? You got a car out of the gig, as I understand it. So I now, did. I got. You, I got a. I got a 2004 Toyota Tacoma pickup. Still, where, it was my favorite car. Did it, did it last a while? I assume it's. Been it lasted retired a long now. time. Yeah. Yeah, it's been retired now. It was sold for parts. Um, but I let my. <laughs> she was a beaut. Um, no, but I. Um, yeah, it lasted a while. It lasted a while, but then I was I was in LA and I didn't I didn't bring it to Los Angeles. It did take me to, actually. It did take me to um, New Orleans, from Jersey to New Orleans for season three of American Horror Story. There you go. Um, took me there, got me back and forth to work, drove me home, back all the way to New Jersey after it was done. So ah, it's a good truck. So, and now you demand a different automobile on every project, I take it. Oh That's, yeah, yeah, for sure. I have You're... like a 20 car garage. <laughs> <laughs> so you and Jay Leno, just car collectors, <laughs> famous car collectors. Yeah, except <laughs> except they have, to, like the only rule is that they have to be certified pre owned <laughs> Right. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, so you mentioned American Horror Story, which I mean, mm-hmm. again, for those that know you a little bit about you, it's this kind of irony where you 
you get this and from what I gather, it's a pretty early audition, if not like the first, mm-hmm. maybe the second. And it's a TV audition. So it sets you on this bizarre path that like wasn't necessarily, it's not your thing. It's not your genre. And yet For it sure. has become what you are most identified with. Um, give me a sense of sort of <sighs> journey of you oh. as a scream queen, as a horror yeah. maven. Um, yeah. have, you, have you wrestled with it? Have you kind of been like, okay, at a certain point I need to put a cap on this or like I'll own it as far as it will take me? You know, I think recently I've had both those feelings where yeah. it's like, okay, it's cool. Like I love, I love that I'm loved for this. And this is what I, and this is what has got me so far in my career. And then I'm like, oh, I want to do something different. Come in Gilded Age, which, you know, scratch that itch and it's great. And then also when um, my, my, my partner, my husband, he's, um, he's a writer producer and, you know, we really love to work together. We, we met through friends. We've never gotten to collaborate. And so we've been, there's been projects that we're working or trying to develop and stuff. And I find myself that I'm drawn to like, horror horror adjacent like I call it away like two turns away from horror and it's just um I don't know I love it I don't know whether it was meant for me or I just you know my it came at a perfect moment um in my like development and growth as as a as an adult and as an actor um but it's funny because it's the absolute opposite of what I like to watch right but you send me a script you send me a comedy script and I'm like well I don't know I, I don't know I can't do that I don't I don't there's the character what's there I don't know but you, but you, um, but then you give me like the darkest, most fucked up script yeah. and I want to do it. Talk to me. Okay. So, and where, and where does Gilded Age fit into that? Is that something, is that the kind of stuff you would be watching or is that like horror in a different way? No. Not necessarily the thing you would watch. Not necessarily the thing I would watch. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, but don't get me wrong. Once I, once I booked the job, I, I went and started watching Downton Abbey or it was before I had the, I knew they were interested in me and they liked my audition. I was going to meet with Michael Engler and have the, um, like a director's audition session and it, once I got that I started watching down to now because I'm like okay shit gotta you yeah. know gotta brush up I don't want to yeah. <laughs> I don't want to say the wrong thing or you, not have an answer you, you sound just like a Downton Abbey character saying like, oh shit I gotta brush up <laughs> oh fuck here we go <laughs> right I was perfect for it you sound just like Maggie Smith it's crazy I'm pretty uh I ended up watching I think like three seasons of of, of Downton Abbey before I even realized that I was on season three and I'm like what the hell why is this so addicting yeah. Um, which is probably why I, I enjoyed some of the scripts and, and the audition. But I mean, like, it's such a funny fit because Gladys is, yeah, my, so my character from Gilded Age, like, she definitely is a, reminds me of, of say, she's 17, but she reminds me of like 15 parts of 15 year old me. But um, I remember meeting Michael Engler, the director, in the audition. And, you know, I don't know, we were just talking about it. And he was like, oh, he's like, do you have you, do you really love watching like period pieces? You, you fall into it so easily. Like, this, you must, this is a passion of yours. And I was like, I was like, I don't know. Uh, I'm a stoner. I like to watch Rick and Morty. <laughs> and then I walked out of the audition and I was like, I called, I called my husband or I guess he was my fiance. I don't know. I called my, I called my partner, my dude. And um, I was like, shit, I don't know if I just said the wrong thing. I should have talked about Downton Abbey. It's amazing. It clearly yeah. was the right thing. So what, what is, I mean, it's funny because I've talked to so many actors about prep for different kinds of roles and you, you know, the, the cliche is you talk to an actor, they're going to do like the World War II movie and they like train with like, you know, the Marines for three months and they're yeah. in boot camp and whatever. Like, this is a different kind of precision though that like, I mean, you have to like, there is a very precise manner of the way you walk and speak and forks you use. It sounds, maybe it sounds silly or doesn't sound silly to people, but you have to like buy that authenticity. Mm-hmm. Was there kind of an odd, unique prep work to fully inhabit this world? Oh yeah, um, for sure. I mean, they, I mean, production from the beginning was, was amazing. They, they got me working, or they got everybody, but speaking from my experience, they got me working with, um, Howard Samuelson, who is the dialect coach and, and, um, yeah, just start one piecing together the, 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 the speaking habits and, and, and how to work on that, getting into it. Um, you know, it was interesting because it, it started off way more proper and specific and closer to the time period. But when we finally got towards filming, they had tweaked in there, like, look, we don't want to alienate modern audiences because it sounds so different. Right. So I was happy that they found like a, a happy medium of sounding okay, this doesn't sound like now, but it doesn't sound like way over then. Yeah, I got you. Um, but yeah, for prep work, for sure, HBO had put together, or production had put together this sort of, um, um, this like dossier, this research Bible of all the information you needed to know about the 1880s, everything from just everyday sort of um, manners and, and, and social etiquette to 
um, you know, how to hold your fork, how to, you know, how to curtsy at a man, how, um, I don't know, how the railroads were working at the time and how much money people were making and, you know, the, the divide between poverty and, and, and the wealthy and how much manure <laughs> covered the streets in New York every day. It was going to smell like shit when you go outside. So think about that. I'd rather not. Um, you know. how, how much manure, by the way? Do you have a? Do you have oh a- my god! I think it was like. Uh, <laughs> uh, I wish I had this fact written down. Okay. It was it's like okay. it was like it, I don't know. It was a few. It was a few hundred tons. Okay. A few hundred tons a month. <laughs> You could, say, you could say anything and I would be like, Honestly, that's a lot was, of manure. Was, that's a lot. It was, the streets were covered. The streets yeah. were, it basically was streets made of horse crap. I do feel like that's a thought that crosses my mind sometimes in watching films or TV of this period is like, this all looks great, but it probably smells horrible. It smells terrible. Oh like, yeah. I mean, plumbing, the lack of plumbing, all of it. It's just. Oh not, yeah. Everyone, and yeah. even when we're filming the exterior scenes, you have the horses going like, man, they're, they're, they're real creatures. They got to do their thing. Yeah. They kind of helped us get into the character. You, uh, this is one of those series that like every actor, like, like on the, like the sixth person in the seed is like the best, like New York theater actor. Like, it's just like, it's crazy. Like It's ridiculous. I, I forget. I think they were saying it was like 17 Tony award winning actors. And then I heard the number jumped up to like 20 plus. I don't know. It's, it's phenomenal. We were so lucky that, I mean, lucky the one positive, I think of filming during COVID was that Broadway had been shut down. So there, um, there was a lot of availability with those actors and yep. we're so fortunate to be able to have them. Um, one actor that I positively love, and I know you adore, uh, the great Carrie Coon, ah. um, who's delightful. She, she is so delightful. She was on the podcast like a year ago when she was shooting this and I mm-hmm. forgot to hit record. Uh, <laughs> and we had to do the podcast the second time <laughs> and yeah. she did it without a, she did it. I'm sure, and I'm sure she did it just as well with just as much energy and enthusiasm. She's, I- she's awesome. She's, She's a unique, I, she's a character. She's like, kind of like awesome. She's, uh, she's really, really cool. She makes me so happy. I think she makes the entire room happy. Like, I don't know how else to explain it. She's so unapologetically herself. And she's not just like this, like smiley, happy woman. She's fucking cool. Yeah. And she's like, got an edge to her, but she's also caring and kind at the same time. And it's such a perfect mix. And, and, um, yeah, I, I, I loved working with her and she would always pick on me and tease me and that's how I knew she loved me and it was it was so it was so perfect for the Bertha Gladys um dynamic you know between Carrie and I well you're in good company I mean I know this from talking to her and hearing stories like from her her feature debut was in Gone Girl and she like gave no less than David Fincher shit and I think that's why he responded to her because he's like he is also that kind of character and like yeah. respects respects the back and yeah, forth yeah so absolutely awesome. she's so cool and, she, and on top of that being a rad person she's also just a phenomenal actress Totally, totally. So um, one question from the audience, I always ask uh, the listeners for questions from mm-hmm. Jen Caden wanted to know what's one surprising thing you learned while working on set? I guess this is outside of the manure. I uh, mean, the manure one was pretty overwhelming. It's to hard to top that, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I knew the amount. I should have memorized it. You know, uh, Blake Ritson, who plays Oscar Van Ryan, he would have been able to tell you. Damn Oscar. <laughs> um, the most interesting thing I learned, I would say, oh, so part of Okay, so we were talking a little bit before about um, the research and prep. We did the dialect, and also they gave us like this dossier of all the information, which we all read through. But they also um, hired professors and historians, or historians and professors, Erica Dunbar and Helen Vate, who gave a series of lectures um, on the 1880s. So, like, you know, we sort of had, um, I don't know, there was like, there was like etiquette and health and nutrition with Helen Vate. And then there was, um, gender and, and race studies with, with uh, Erica Dunbar of that time period. Yeah. And, um, so some of the things we, um, some of the, like, what am I trying to say? Like, one, it was a phenomenal image of having the entire Gilded Age cast from like Christine Baranski to me, to Harry Richardson, to everybody se- seated at these like tiny little school desks, taking notes at our lectures so and cool. learning that. all about um, like the etiquette. And that covers so much. The, I think the, the, the thing that I found the most interesting was learning about um, eating habits and stuff everything had to be super slow. Like you can't make noise. Your fork can't clink on the plate. You can't, no noise. You can't express pleasure or happiness or joy or anything about eating. Like it, like if food tastes good, you can't express it. You can't be grateful for like the beautiful meal. You can't say thank you to the servants. But what, yeah, what freaked me out the most was like, they're like, oh, eating is our most animalistic behavior. And, and, and they wanted to disassociate from that as far as possible. So everything had to be 
like literally, I think there's a scene where Carrie takes like one pee on her fourth. And that's not just like an actor messing up. That's literally what you're supposed to do. <laughs> wow. Amazing. Yeah. No yummy noises. No, mm, no, mm, that's not. Wow. No, none of that. <laughs> um, so backtracking a bit. Okay. So we talked mm-hmm. a little bit about the stuff leading into this and obviously American Horror Story. We should mention, I, I'm just curious, like what it does for a career when among the, the projects you've been in, in that kind of genre, um, the nun was huge. Like, I didn't even realize how yeah. huge it was. Like, yeah. I mean, budget to box office. It's like mm-hmm. probably one of the most profitable films in recent years. Yeah, um, for sure. Does that, well, I guess a couple questions on that. Uh, just mm-hmm. you're, you're the lead in that. You are the nun. So does that change? You'd probably been the lead a few times already, but you know, mm-hmm. a bigger budget, more eyeballs oh, on it. Sure, you knew yeah. did that feel like a a jump, a different kind of pressure? Did you embrace that moment? What, what do you recollect from? Um, yeah, it was, it's a, I love The Nun. I mean, I love that whole experience. I think it was one of the performances that I looked, that I, when I first watched it, I was so genuinely happy with the work that I did. And I saw all my prep work and I saw all of it go into my performance. And I'm very hard on myself. I'm a perfectionist. Like, you know, it's not something that's easy for me to say. And it felt so good to, to see something come out the way, you know, close to what you would imagine. Right. Um, I'll also say at that time period for like two and a half years. So between from the start of filming that to when it, it, it premiered, I was dealing with um, just like health issues for, mm-hmm. for um, that time. And, and so, yes, yeah, so like when this movie was coming out, I found out I had a parasite in my blood. I was feeling so, I was just emotionally so drained and have anything left to give physically. I was so weak and tired. Um, but it was around the time that the, the premiere was there and I was just so, so happy. So it was like funny to think I was so excited for this thing. I remember I was living, I was living in like Hollywood Hills near Franklin and Galanga and they had in Los Angeles and they had the, there's like this wall where they put up all the movie posters. And like one day we drove by and it was half my face on every single poster. And of course you go and like, you take your, you take your selfies. Of course. <laughs> and, um, but it was jarring. Cause like I, forget I don't know I just you just yeah I was so in like into personal stuff that like you forget that the world's still going and even though I was working doing all that but um yeah I don't know the nun was one of my most favorite experiences I ever from filming to doing press like doing god we uh uh, Warner Brothers did this like whole press junket in in like in an in an old what was it it was something in like outside of Mexico City it was like I don't know if it was right. an insane asylum or an old. I wasn't there, but I remember seeing some of my compatriots out there. I think I saw oh, you guys yeah. also at Comic Con. That's got to be a yeah, trip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was so cool. And if we went to Comic Con first, and that sort of like kickstarted um, the first like interviews and press for it. And I was like, oh, I act. This is like I get to talk about something I'm excited about. Like not that yeah. I wasn't previously, but again, talking about like gaining confidence and and being in my mid twenties, I was more assured. And so going into interviews, it wasn't like, oh no, what if I mess right. up? It's just like cool. This is what I get to talk about. Yeah. Um, so it's very exciting. Very, very, very exciting. Well, we've got a great offer for listeners and viewers of Happy Sad Confused today. Go to nordvpn.com slash happy sad. Sign up. You get a 30-day money-back guarantee on the fastest VPN on the market. I use NordVPN because I want to feel safe and secure when I'm doing my thing on the internet. NordVPN's mission is simple, guys. They strive to make the internet better than it is today. I know, novel idea. Yes, the internet can be free from online threats, from censorship, from surveillance. You can feel safe and secure when you're doing your thing. Plus, it's more than a VPN. Their threat protection shields you from malware, trackers, and ads. Their dark web monitor notifies you if someone leaks your credentials, God forbid. Their mesh net allows you to connect to your devices remotely and securely. Their dedicated IP helps you avoid block lists and more. They are very conscious of privacy, guys. They don't track or share what you do online. Your traffic is always protected with a robust encryption. You can turn on the kill switch to make sure your data is never ever exposed. They've got tons of extra perks and features too. 24-7 customer support, 30-day money-back guarantee, as I said, dedicated apps for all major platforms, and more. So go to nordvpn.com slash happy said. That's nordvpn.com slash happy said. Sign up today with their 30-day money-back guarantee. (laughs) 
does it in the wake of that did it increase the appetite for you know franchise stuff and i know that's a broad brush there's good franchise stuff there's shitty franchise stuff and you know we sure, talked sure. harry potter that's the good stuff and there's <laughs> there's plenty of crap out there too but yeah. does it like as a young actor does it feel like do you feel that in, in your stomach, just knowing like, oh, I, I should strategically and creatively probably try to align with one of these things? It's, mm -hmm. it's a smart move. Or is that is that dangerous to think about from your standpoint? I think I've been really fortunate that I've been working pretty consistently over the last like decade or 11 years of my career. Um, so a lot of times when the decisions for a job comes, it's it's Sometimes it's been financial. Sometimes it's been creative and just jumping into a project I'm super excited about. Um, the Nun was something I really, really wanted. I had auditioned. I remember getting the audition, getting the email for the audition when I was in the kitchen with Yura. She was in town for like two days. Um, she and the family were were in LA and they rented a house and she was cooking dinner. I was like, oh, that's funny. I got an audition for this thing called The, the Nun. It's, it's part of the, the Conjuring universe. I couldn't believe it. And I was like, well, great. I'm not going to get it. Which is fine. Like, you know what I mean? I was like, there's, I get, they probably want to differentiate whatever. Right. So I thought it was going against me. Um, and then I auditioned for it and I thought I did really well. And again, I, I, it's three, you can ask my husband how rarely I call him being like, I can crush that. <laughs> and, um, I got it. Yeah. I think, I mean, I don't know. I think he loved me. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, I could say it now because they did, yeah. but, um, yeah, I was super, super excited for it. And I don't know, I just, yeah, the idea of being a part of something that is a franchise already has like an established base of viewers of fans, it's exciting because you know, you're already gonna get eyeballs on it. I mean, I think part of that's also why Gilded Age was so excited for me. Cause again, it's not something I watch, but um, like a period drama is not something I'm, I'm, I'm fully normally drawn to, but that world is something I've never been associated with. And on top of that, it's from a career who's already created something that has such a fan base and people are so excited about it and yeah. watching it myself, seeing how he makes these really nuanced characters, combining all that with HBO, I was like, how do I not go for this? Totally. You know? Um, yeah. What about, uh, so on the inevitable comic book side of things, I read somewhere, I don't know if it's true or not, that <laughs> maybe you did the the Hawkeye thing, you did the Kate Bishop audition. Was that something that you remember being up for? Well, that means you've done enough. I can, that means you've done I've, enough I've comic done, book I've auditions done, I've that done you a can't remember. <laughs> no, I have a weird memory. I like don't remember details. I remember emotions and feelings. So, like, yeah, like I don't know. I, like you're talking about Blingering earlier. I remember uh, Katie Chang, one of the other actresses on it. She'll like remember like specific things and days and all this. And I'm like, I don't know. I was just stressed that day, or I, you know, like I just remember. I like remember. I don't know the emotion. So, what is the emotion with? Like, do you get worked up about auditions? You, you talked about killing it on the on the nun, but like, are there? You've, you've got everyone's got the horror stories. Generally speaking, mm -hmm. do you have more than your share of that, or are you pretty chill in, I in feel, that environment? I, what I like, what I do when I'm under pressure or I'm going into a scenario that causes me anxiety, which is a lot of scenarios in life. Um, I do have a lot of anxiety. I, I just present myself as calm it's the strangest thing if it's I'm going into a room with other people not that I'm trying to hide it I take my few deep breaths and I go in and I just sort of I just sort of think how would I how would I I don't know if I was dealing with someone who's super anxious sometimes I get uncomfortable because that person is so anxious I'm like want to make them come. you know I don't know I just sort of so you're playing the role of confident, calm Thaisa. Exactly. I mean, to get into it, but then to then be prepared to play the role of the audition that I'm, yeah, <laughs> it's a weird mind. Me uh, this is, this meta is Daniel weird. Day Lewis level shit. This is, <laughs> this is big. Um, but yeah, I, I also, I know I can be hard on myself. So I always try to, um, I don't like my highs to be too high because high, I don't like my lows to be too low. So with auditions, I always try to go in and, and do it. And, I was, and then like at the end I'm done, it's like, wash my hands cool that's it if yep. they're if my if my manager or my agent calls me about it that means there's something to hear if they don't whatever we'll see what the next thing is because yep. if i dwell on it too much then yeah i mean i think star wars was probably one of the only ones that i was like oh did they like it like what's going on because again another thing I, I grew up with was was star wars i loved playing like star wars the old republic video games with my brother growing up oh, and cool. like that was that was my thing um was that for the first one was that like when they brought in like everybody for those first it was for I think it, been, it was it wasn't for the first one I think it was for um like a rogue one maybe or uh 
It wasn't Rogue One. It was the one after that. Oh, wasn't solo. there one? Oh, Solo. Wait, wait, was it? Uh... No, it wasn't Solo. No, wait, uh, I can't remember. It's the one. It was the one. Ray had already been in one movie. You know what I mean? Wasn't oh, okay. there a so, second so... one with Ray? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a trilogy. So Last Jedi. So maybe it was the one that maybe yeah. Kelly, Kelly Marie Tran maybe eventually got that role. Who knows? I can't remember. But I I, I know what that was not just I didn't do well because I wanted it so badly. Oh, really? So that's why I try to keep my expectations. You didn't remember and, to play cool, calm, collected I did, Thaisa. Exactly. I couldn't do it. It was also hard because those auditions, they um, it was one of the only few times that I had to do a cold read where they didn't send you the material before. You can get there an hour ahead of time. And I'm like, and usually I'm good at memorizing lines. Like it's, it's, it goes yeah. quick and easy, but um, I was just so like, oh, this would be so cool. Yeah, you're worked up. And also, uh, if I'm wrong, often like the sides and that stuff for the audition materials aren't even related to really. It's not like, even, yeah, stuff. it's not even really real. No, I think there's like maybe one, I don't know, lightsaber reference or something. But um, <laughs> So it knows you're in that world somehow, but it wasn't fully, yeah. It's a long uh, career. We're going to secret into the universe. You in a Star Wars movie. They're going to keep making <laughs> Harry Potters. We're going to get there too. Incredible. Um, yeah. You know, it's, I don't know. It's exciting. I, um, I'm open. I'm open to, I'm open to anything. I like new experiences. I, I like learning and growing. And I think that's why I, I was excited about Gilded Age. It was a, it was a brand new, um, yeah, it was a brand new thing to experience, a totally. new perspective to sort of understand. And I'm, I'm always game for anything, whether it's, horror horror adjacent or apparently a period piece where i look like i'm 12 years old <laughs> gladys russell baby embrace it embrace your youth while you got I'll it while we it. got exactly. it we got it right <laughs> how's the dog or dogs how many dogs at home two dogs two, two dogs. dogs um actually um so the older dog her name's red she's a sweetheart like just emotionally, I can, she, she, she can tell, like if I, if I come home and I'm upset over an audition, she can just, she, she knows and she comes to me. The little one who he, so she just turned 15 on Saturday. The little one, he's four wow. and a half. I express any kind of emotion, excitement, sadness, rage. He just runs. <laughs> he's just like, oh, you're feeling things again. Nope. Like Don't I start learning, <laughs> I start learning lines for an audition. And he's like, I see his ears turning. He's like, mm, and he likes, he like, like tiptoes and like sneaks away so he's great he's a little he's a little shit and he goes on runs for me with me and he's the best but uh the older dog red she turned 15 on saturday and she was so happy and energetic and then that night she um had a really bad night and was was vomiting all night and trembling and shaking and couldn't breathe and collapsed and we had to take her to the vet and so sunday i i cried all day sunday i actually rewatched mean girls because i needed a comfort movie i was so sad and scared and she had a long life and you know we know we know to appreciate the good, but we thought maybe we had to put her down. And, and luckily, you know, luckily, um, 24 hours of care at the hospital. And then um, we were able to take her home because, you know, the vet's expensive. It's like, doesn't matter how hard you work. Like we've been in a pandemic. I was like, I love her, but like, you can only spend yeah. so much before yeah. it's it's too much. So I'm so happy we brought her home because I was, I was, I was literally about to text my publicist and be like, I don't know. I don't know if we have to tell Josh that I can't do it. I'm so I would have forgiven you uh, because I, I'm a dog owner this last year. Okay, and I have, good. I have, I have grown a heart oh. where I didn't know I had one. And I relate yeah. to every single thing you're how are, saying. How is it going? How are you as a dad? Just, I need to know real quick. Oh, I am obsessed. I am a crazy person. I like just, yeah. <laughs> Lucy is three. She's a pit mix. She's a rescue. Nice. And she she has captured my cold heart, which is growing. I'm so glad to hear it. Yes. I'm so glad. I thought something was different about you. <laughs> <laughs> Look, and she was, and she was ill recently. And you're right. It just takes it. Oh my God. It it's hurt. Just, I mean, oh, like it's, yeah. my husband, my husband has had her for four, she's 15. He's had her for about 14 years. I've been there for the last seven and a half. And like, it feels like you're losing a limb. And even though logically you can understand it's still like, but not yet. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad they're the best. Yeah. Glad they're doing better. And Thank I'm glad, you. I'm glad Gilded Age has given us an excuse to catch up, even in these yes. crazy, ongoing, insane times and Zoom boxes. Yes. Um, congratulations on the show. Um, Appreciate it, Josh. Thanks for the time, as always. And, um, and yeah, get back to your fanfic. I know you've got a big night ahead <laughs> of you. Writing or reading. I don't know what, what's up. But... I tried to write once. It was not great. Oh, no. <laughs> we're gonna yeah, post... we're not. We're gonna post that alongside the, uh, oh, the trust selfie me, it's from Bling Ring. Deleted a long time ago. <laughs> you flushed the cache. You deleted yeah. everything. You <laughs> threw the hard drive in the trash. Smart lady. Smashed uh, it with a hammer. There you go, uh, <sighs> Taisa Farmiga. You did it. You did happy second fuse. Congratulations. Amazing achievement unlocked. <laughs> and so ends another edition of Happy, Sad, Confused. 
Remember to review, rate and subscribe to this show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm a big podcast person. I'm Daisy Ridley and I definitely wasn't pressured to do this by Josh. Ha <laughs> ha